We begin this report with a short quiz. Name the following African country. It was never really colonised by Europeans. It's one of the most populous on the continent and a place of extraordinary history and diversity. It has a big area of fertile farming land and more cattle than any other country in Africa. And its name is a byword for famine. If you answered Ethiopia, then take a bow. This is what a big chunk of Ethiopia looks like. Not bad rainfall, reasonably fertile soils, pretty good farming country. Yet after hundreds of millions of dollars in foreign aid and the latest government scheme which was meant to end hunger, millions of Ethiopians still face the yearly risk of starvation. Why? That's the question we're going to try to answer. A lot of Ethiopians wish their country was known for something other than disaster. Ethiopia should be famous for Asmari, a musical tradition combining verse, song and humour. It's hugely popular, and Adani Tekka is one of the best in the business. The problem is that many Ethiopians simply can't manage. Without regular foreign aid, millions would starve. All Ethiopians do not like to beg. Uh, all Ethiopians uh, feel ashamed that they have to depend on foreign aid for their daily bread. Uh, and they are eager uh, to overcome that uh, sense of humiliation. As an Ethiopian, how does it make you feel to be so dependent on foreign aid? It makes me feel very bad, uh, ashamed. Uh, it's not something that anybody wants to be in. Yet that's precisely the position Ethiopians found themselves in again this year. <laughs> Ethiopia isn't just poor, it's crowded. There are nearly 70 million people here, and around 20% of them are lining up for food aid this year. <laughs> this has been the biggest crisis since the famine of 84-85 and the difference is that the resources came through early enough and in sufficient quantity so that we didn't have mass starvation like you had in 84-85. But for how much longer will the world be willing to feed Ethiopia? <laughs> this year we have this, this uh, drought, you have 14 million people affected. I mean, if you take this trend, by 2025, by 2028, you would have roughly about 50 million people starved. And I don't think there is going to be any foreign aid that would help these people at that time.
The Bariche district in the country's south used to be able to feed itself. While it looks lush, a succession of bad harvests has left one in five people this year on the brink of starvation. You can see that he is wasted. And on top of that, I can, I can feel that his bones are not that strong right inside him, which shows that he has deficiency of vitamins or few very important minerals. This year, deaths from malnutrition will probably number in the tens of thousands. A shocking figure by any standard, but in Ethiopia, this counts as disaster avoided. Millions will go hungry, but most will live. Is there a chance that this child will recover? Yes, most, uh, most do. Uh, it, it Even in this state? Even in this state. Some, some may die. It's the will of the Lord. We don't know which one will survive, but we try very hard ourselves for these children to, to have a better life. Foreign aid agencies come in with their emergency feeding centres, their food supplies, all of it vital and important, but increasingly Ethiopians are asking why they can't break this cycle. We have lived with, with drought for centuries. It's not a new experience to, to Ethiopians. But it's looked that we Ethiopians have never really learned from, from our past drought, from our past crisis. Even if we did learn, we are not in a position to, to prevent the next one. Galfatu Fanissa says he's somewhere between 55 and 60 years old. He doesn't quite know. In a country where average male life expectancy remains stuck in the 40s, that makes him a very successful farmer. But even he's struggling now. This is tobacco, given to him for free by the government. Perhaps it'll bring in a little cash. He's had to sell all but one of his cows. <laughs> With only half a hectare of land and 14 children, Galfato is never able to build up a reserve. The line between success and catastrophe is very fine. Because land is state-owned, most farmers can't build decent-sized holdings, let alone borrow money to improve their farms. Ethiopia's Prime Minister doesn't think that's the main problem. He believes that if farmers like Galfato can just grow a little bit more, then eventually the whole economy will improve. Our uh, hope, based on uh, previous experience of other countries, is that as agriculture improves, it uh, uh, creates space for uh, private sector development in small and micro enterprise, in trade, and so on and therefore would uh, reduce the pressure on land. So the government's strategy is agriculture first, second and third. It's where nearly all the effort goes. The government's latest big idea to try to end the country's chronic food shortage was to dramatically increase grain production. So they allowed a private market and made fertiliser widely available. Sure enough, grain production did go up spectacularly but prices fell just as quickly. So the next year, farmers didn't plant as much because it wasn't worth their while. Then there was a drought, and before long, Ethiopia had the begging bowl out again. The Prime Minister concedes there have been mistakes, but insists agriculture is the way forward. Uh, and so we need to do more to improve the efficiency of rural marketing. We need to do more to uh, improve productivity in the drought-affected areas and the areas which uh, are affected by uh, land degradation. Uh, otherwise, I think the basic strategy is sound.
Others argue that relying on agriculture is part of the problem, not the solution. Coffee is one of the few things Ethiopia has which the world wants. 60% of the country's export income is from coffee. But the world price for coffee has been falling for years. The lesson for a country such as Ethiopia is that you cannot continue to depend on one commodity for your export and hope to develop your economy. There must be a process of diversification taking place if these countries are going to develop at all. Berahanu Nega is an economist and he thinks the government is wrong to rely on agriculture as the way of pulling Ethiopia out of poverty. At least the starting point is to recognise the, the crucial uh, nature of this the need for diversification and to have to start the process of collective thinking about how do we go about it. Galfato Fanissa used to grow coffee, but he stopped because he couldn't make money out of it anymore. Through no fault of his own, Galfato is going backwards. People have become more destitute over the last 10 years rather than less. And I think that, that that went against what has been said by the World Bank and other institutions who are saying, oh, everything's getting better in Ethiopia, we don't have to worry so much. We said that's not our on-the-ground experience. So John to... Graham heads up Save the Children UK in Ethiopia. But the reality is that subsistence agriculture by itself is not going to raise Ethiopia out of the, the recurring problems that it has. But we have to have a development strategy that's forward-looking. It should not be based on what we have now. Just because the majority of the population is in agriculture, it doesn't mean that the majority of the population has to continue to be in agriculture. When ethnic parties were not organised... Berahanu Nega is an academic economist, but he's also an entrepreneur. So when he came back home from the United States, he started up a fertiliser factory, since no one else was using the bones from the local abattoir. What can be done with this? And I uh, discovered that you can actually do a very, very good organic fertiliser, which, considering that it's a predominantly agricultural society that imports quite a lot of fertilisers from abroad, thought it would be a very good import substitution, but also that it would add organic matter to the soil, which has been quite eroded uh, through time. The latest family business is a pharmaceutical factory. Oh, this is an anti-malarial drug. We produce it at about one third the cost of imports and we create jobs while we're uh, doing that. So Berahanu that's, Nega that's left really Ethiopia one, uh, as a teenager 25 years ago, during one of the most repressive periods in his country's history. Since he returned in the mid-90s, he's become convinced of two things. That the economy must stop relying on agriculture and that Ethiopians must stop relying on aid. There are some parts of Ethiopian peasant communities that have been getting aid for the last 15, 20 years. I mean, the, the only way to survive they know now is uh, food um, aid dependence. Northern Ethiopia saw the worst of the famine nearly 20 years ago. It's green now, but much of this is marginal farming land. International aid agencies are well established here. Save the Children UK is running a pilot project to help farmers near Sakota set up a grain bank. <laughs> Many of these people have been getting food aid for years, and some see little reason now to change. Each member of the cooperative gets a monthly ration. But they're agreed that borrowers will be charged interest to make the grain bank sustainable. 
Tarek Yasefa knows tough times. He survived the 80s famine by walking out of it, as they did regularly when the rains failed. But he doesn't have to leave his little village anymore because for the last 15 years he's been getting just enough food aid to survive. Even in a good season, four million Ethiopians rely on food aid. It's this institutionalised dependency which worries Berahanu Nega. When you depend on foreign aid for the last 15, 20 years continuously, it's much more important to listen to donors, to listen to foreigners, than, than to listen to uh, the debate taking place in your own society. And then at one point, the debate within your society also stops because people start saying, you know, it doesn't make any difference anyway. So, you know. Who does the government listen to? The donors who tell you what they want to spend their money on or the people who are out there trying to make ends meet? Well, to the extent possible, we try to listen to everybody. <laughs> Tarek Yasefa has a new beehive courtesy of the aid agency. That should mean a little more honey and a little more cash. The government would like to move him off his land to somewhere more fertile, but he doesn't want to go, and the government's not about to force him. But even if people want to move, they often won't because they're afraid they'll be left destitute. That's because land in Ethiopia is owned by the state. The country's peasant farmers rent it. If they leave it, they lose it. If they could sell it and use that money that they got from selling it to go to town and to start up something or to sustain themselves while they looked for a job, then I think people would be, you know, would be moving much more. But the government refuses to consider land privatisation for fear of flooding the cities. Now, what would happen if we drive, say, four million uh, farmers out of the land? Would they get uh, employment in the urban areas? Could we create uh, four million jobs in, say, three to five years? That's simply out of the question. So people are stuck in a kind of state-run feudalism, topped up by the wrong sort of foreign aid. According to the Prime Minister, Ethiopia needs more money for development and fewer sacks of foreign grain. The US, for example, provided something like close to $500 million of food aid uh, during the current year and gave us something like $4 million for agricultural development at the same time. Now, I think uh, USAID has come uh, to the conclusion that this is completely rational. No one in this debate suggests Ethiopians are lazy. Just try ploughing a field like this. Nobody is out there sitting around saying, gee, it doesn't matter if I produce anything or not because the kind people of Australia will send me something to eat. Everybody works as hard as they can. And despite that hard work and despite maximizing their production, they still find themselves short. 
The really hard bit all. about this, assuming you can even control the cattle, oh. is to stop it going into the other furrow, which I haven't managed to do. But it'd be better if those who wanted to leave the land could. At the moment, there's nothing to encourage them. And everyone agrees that aid dependency is also an issue. I would argue that one of the reasons why we are not going anywhere is precisely because people have lost significantly the, the confidence in themselves and in their ability to make, uh, to improve their own, uh, their own conditions. And that damage, I'm not suggesting, is entirely caused by foreign aid. But I would argue that it has contributed to a certain degree to this. The extraordinary stone churches of Lalibela, carved from the solid rock, reflect an earlier age of high achievement in Ethiopia. For centuries, people here have endured drought and famine with little more than faith and stoicism. With the right sort of help, Ethiopians should now feel it's within their power to bring this misery to an end.